Top Cupcakes founders Daniel Ong and Jimmy Teo were charged in court today, accused of underpaying their foreign employees. Police were called in to disperse a large crowd at a school uniform supplier after some parents paid no attention to safe distancing rules. And here's a first look at what seniors can look forward to at the next BTO exercise, the all-new Community Care Apartments. Good evening, I'm Harian Tudiman. You're watching The Big Story coming to you live from the Straits Times newsroom. Now you can subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. Daniel Ong and Jamie Teo, founders of homegrown pastry chain 12 Cupcakes, have been charged with offences under Singapore's Employment of Foreign Manpower Act. The former radio DJ and his ex-wife, a former model, separately arrived in court today, each facing 24 charges. They are accused of allowing 12 cupcakes to underpay or fail to pay within a fixed time frame the salaries of eight foreign employees between September 2012 and December 2016. Ong and Teo are due back in court next month. Now, if found guilty, they could be jailed for up to a year, fined up to $10,000 or both per charge. In an Instagram post reflecting what a tough year it's been, Ong said, quote, being dragged into a case from 2012 to 2016 when an errant third-party agent we used to hire foreign workers submitted documents and salaries we were not aware of till 2019, but as directors of the company, liable. Now, 12 Cupcakes was founded by the former couple in 2011 and sold to India-based Dunsari Group five years later. Earlier this month, the company pleaded guilty to 15 charges of underpaying employees. The prosecutor has urged the court to impose a fine of $127,000. Now on to the latest COVID-19 figures here. 13 new cases were confirmed today. None were in the community or from within workers' dormitories. All 13 were imported and placed on stay-home notices or isolated on arrival in Singapore. The Health Ministry will share more details tonight. Separately, in the words of President Halima Yaakob, Singaporeans have shown time and again to be made of sterner stuff. In a New Year's message released by the Istana, Madam Halima said she is confident Singapore will win the battle against the coronavirus. 2020 has been a very unusual and challenging year for everyone. COVID-19 has caused serious economic and social disruptions. We now have to reassess the way we organise our lives, work and businesses as there is no going back to the pre-COVID-19 period. I am confident that we can overcome this COVID-19 crisis together and we will continue to build a better future for our children and grandchildren. For this, we need all hands on deck. I wish all Singaporeans a very happy 2021. Meanwhile, in a Facebook post today, Minister for Social and Family Development Masago Zakifli shared that around 95,000 Singaporeans and permanent residents have received financial help through the COVID-19 support grant. This includes 22,000 people who successfully applied for a second tranche. While he did not state the total amount disbursed, it was reported in October that about $148 million was distributed through the grant. He added those who are eligible and in need of help could still apply for the CSG till 6pm on December 31st. Separately, to provide some cushion as other financial support schemes like the CSG and SIRS draw to a close by the end of the year, residents can apply for the new COVID-19 recovery grant. Applications for the CRG open on January 18th. Now, more information on the eligibility criteria and application can be found at MSF's website. From next Monday, January 4th, there will be no limit on how long patrons can stay in the National Library, Public Libraries, National Archives of Singapore and the former Ford Factory for weekday visits. But time limits will still be in place for weekend visits. Booking of preferred time slots can be done online. The National Library Board will also gradually resume its public programs except for guided tours. Now, more information can be found at NLB's Go Library site. 
Meanwhile, the National Arts Council and the Singapore Tourism Board will be accepting pilot applications for outdoor live performances for up to 250 audience members in zones of 50 each. The NAC added under Phase 3 of Singapore's reopening, audiences of up to 250 in groups of 50 are also allowed in indoor venues. This is up from audiences of 100. Separately, the Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth will also be extending the existing 80% subsidy for venue hire and in-house production costs until March 31st. Now, take a look at this clip. This was the crowd seen this morning outside Jeep Singh Fashion, a uniform shop in Ang Mo Kyo, which prompted the police to step in to disperse the crowd. Many parents were there to buy school uniforms before school starts next week. They had arrived at the store around 8am, two hours before its opening for a queue ticket. And by around 10am, more than 100 people had formed a snaking queue to get into the shop, with some ignoring the one meter safe distancing requirement. Some parents whom the Straits Times spoke to did not manage to get the uniforms despite waiting for hours. Gypsy Fashion declined to comment when contacted. Now, if you are in the market for a community care apartment, you can now visit the exhibition at HDB Up, which features a life-sized mock-up of the senior-friendly flat. Multimedia correspondent Yosem Jo takes a look at what he has to offer. I'm here at a show flat, but not just any show flat. This is a debut of a full-scale replica of a community care apartment, Singapore's first assisted living public housing that will be up for sale in February. These built-to-order flats in Bukit Batok are for seniors aged 65 and above who wish to live on their own but also enjoy communal activities and care services. Each 32 square meter flat comes with elderly friendly fixtures like grab bars, slip resistant bathroom flooring and a wide wheelchair friendly entrance. Every floor will also have a communal space where residents can mingle with their neighbours. This new flat type comes with a mandatory service package that includes a 24-hour emergency monitoring and response service basic health checks, simple home fixes, and communal activities. Visitors to the Community Care Apartments exhibition at HDB Hub in Topayo said they were drawn to the communal style living and services provided. I think this concept is very good for the uh, elderly. Every day they can send a meal for you until your doorstep. Within the price, you can afford to pay. They say you need some helping anytime you can get them. Uh, you feel Moody, there's still some area for you to gathering outside. At least you can get around, sit together, tic-tac. If not happy, you can go to the other floor. I like this house as well. I just come and have a look at everything. It's quite nice. We got still got neighbors who are looking as for us, each other, help, help each other in, in this community. Because we are all anytime, things can be happen, right? It means we have all this community inside. It's good. Ah for us, for all people. The apartments come in leases ranging from 15 to 35 years and cannot be resold or rented out. Owners who no longer need the flat can return it to the housing board, which will refund the value of the flat's remaining lease. Seniors with more pressing care needs, such as those requiring permanent assistance with activities of daily living, will be prioritised for these flats. The apartment exhibition here at HDB Hub includes pricing and lease information, skilled models of the block and flat, as well as the life-size showcase of the communal space. Visitors have until March 31st to check out this exhibition, but must first make a booking via the HDB website. And going by appointments, interest appears to be healthy. Slots in the first week were snapped up quickly, and some slots in January are already fully booked. Yo Sam Jo for The Straits Times. Moving overseas, the Chinese capital of Beijing in the past two weeks has been edging towards a state of alarm. A spate of COVID-19 cases in this city has sparked mass testing, lockdowns of some residential compounds and villages, as well as caused mass gatherings and performances to be cancelled. Since December 14th, some 16 locally transmitted cases were detected, the first domestic infections in Beijing in over 150 days. Separate outbreaks were also detected in the city of Dalian, triggering mass testing which uncovered some 28 cases including 24 asymptomatic ones. 
Experts are warning that these cases might have multiple sources and the fear is that the virus is spreading undetected in these cities. Joining me from Beijing is The Straits Times' China correspondent, Denson Chong. Denson, what is the mood like on the ground? How are the people reacting to the discovery of this latest spate of cases? Well, uh, Jan, it's caused quite a bit of alarm in Beijing where I am. Uh, before this spate of cases, you know, Beijing had not had uh, locally transmitted infection for, for something like 150 days. So, you know, it's caused quite a bit of concern. Um, since December 14, I think just about uh, 16 cases, uh, locally transmitted cases have been, uh, have been discovered. You know, so city authorities you know, have, have said that the situation is severe. They've announced that uh, Beijing is going to, uh, this is what they call emergency mode. And, you know, so it's caused quite a bit of uh, concern. In, in the Shuni district, uh, which is, is near the, the international airport, um, most of the cases have been discovered uh, in this district. Uh, there's been mass testing. And one resident that I spoke to, you know, talked about how people were frightened and afraid. Um, companies there say that, you know, if you haven't, uh, if you don't have a, a negative uh, nucleic acid test, uh, you can't come to work. You know, and at malls and supermarkets and office buildings, they become more strict, you know, on signing in and, and temperature checks. So there's this sense of increased uh, vigilance uh, across uh, around the city. Right. Then you mentioned frightened, you mentioned alarm. Now, comparing to other countries uh, which are also seeing their third and fourth waves, the count for China seems relatively low. So why is it causing alarm? Uh, well, yeah, I think China has been seeing these uh, sporadic outbreaks in, in sort of various cities uh, for, for some months now. And, you know, by and large, it's been quite uh, successful at keeping uh, these uh, situations under control. Uh, you know, the formula is the same, you know, same as Singapore's. Uh, you contact trace, you test, and you isolate. Um, but the, the, the Beijing outbreak is slightly different in the sense that, you know, out of the whole China, Beijing is the, the political center and set some of the strictest controls. Uh, you know, only a number of international flights are allowed to land uh, in Beijing. Uh, unlike a lot of the other areas, uh, you know, you have to do a 14-day quarantine. And if you enter Beijing from a different Chinese city after coming in from overseas, you have to do an additional seven days of what they call medical observation. So the fact that cases have emerged uh, despite these tight controls has, I think, caused quite a bit of concern. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think it's not like the virus is running rampant uh, here. You know, despite the, the, the mass testing, uh, like I mentioned in, in Chun Yi, uh, they've not discovered a lot of cases. Most of the cases that they've discovered are linked uh, to already uh, pre-existing or already discovered cases. So it's an indication that uh, it's not spreading uh, wildly. And, and I think another thing to remember is that Beijing is a, is a mega city of over 20 million people. So in that context, the number of cases that they've discovered is, is, is not large at all. So Denson, with the Chinese New Year celebration uh, coming up uh, in just uh, in, a, in about slightly over a month, how different uh, is the Chinese authority managing this uh, new spate of cases? And looking ahead as well, you know, in the light of uh, increased travel for the celebration. Mm. Uh, well, you, with with uh, this current spate of cases, uh, like you mentioned, they they have uh, implemented some uh, increased uh, controls. Uh, so they've banned sort of large performances. Uh, religious groups have stopped gatherings. Um, you know they've sealed off uh, residential compounds that uh, where cases have been discovered. You know tourist attractions, uh, parks, cinemas, uh, places like these have uh, restricted uh, capacity. Uh, and you know also civil servants have been told not to travel uh, during this uh, holiday period. Uh, so you know it's rolled back uh, a lot of the freedoms that I think city residents have begun to to enjoy in the last few months. Um, and I, I, I think the, the, the main reason is that in Beijing, there's been a kind of fatigue or complacency that set in uh, before this outbreak. And, you know, you go out and you see more and more people uh, not wearing masks, uh, you know, at malls and, and public places. They don't really um, check your temperature, you know, they sort of just go through the motions. So if you look at some of the language that the government has used, uh, you know, to, to, to describe this uh, current outbreak, uh, you know, they talk about uh, going into an emergency mode or going to a war footing, I think a lot of it is aimed at jolting people into into attention. Um, and I think it's because they they know that they have this uh, what they call the double festival or double holiday coming. You know, the New Year's Day and Chinese New Year, where a lot of, a lot of people will be traveling. And I think what they want to prevent is that if you know there is a case that they don't manage to catch, 
that this case then goes on and causes uh, outbreaks or, or super spreader event in, in other cities and the rest of China. I think that's something that they want to prevent and stop happening. Right. Well, thank you so much, Denson, for setting aside time to speak with us and for providing the updates. I've been speaking to the Straits Times' China correspondent, Denson Chong. Now, you can read more on his piece at straitstimes.com. Let's take a quick look at other global headlines. Japan has detected a coronavirus variant found in South Africa. This on top of the country already identifying more than a dozen cases of another variant that is spreading rapidly in Britain. The health ministry said a woman in her 30s who arrived in Japan on December 19th was found to be infected with the new South Africa variant. Meanwhile, India has found six people who returned from Britain in recent weeks infected with the UK strain. The health ministry said all six patients have been kept in isolation and their fellow travellers are being tracked down. Their close contacts have also been put under quarantine. Over in the Philippines, the country will ban travellers from 19 countries and territories until mid-January as a measure to keep out the new variant of the coronavirus. The flagged countries include Singapore, France, Australia, South Africa and Japan. The ban will be in effect from midnight tonight to January 15th and covers Filipinos and foreigners arriving from the flagged countries. The new variant has so far not been detected in the Philippines. Meanwhile, the country has also approved a clinical trial for Janssen's COVID-19 vaccine and could begin trials in the next few weeks. Conversely, Sri Lanka welcomed its first foreign tourists in nine months, even as the new coronavirus strain gripped the island. A charter flight carrying 185 passengers from Ukraine landed south of the capital, which has been stricken by a surge in COVID-19 cases and deaths. Still, authorities hope the Ukrainian arrivals will be the first of thousands of foreigners to visit, easing pressure on the tourism-reliant economy that was shut down in March. And just before we go, jazz maestro Jeremy Montero will be having a very special year-end concert titled Yuletide Swing to wind down 2020 and head into the new year. Joined by a stellar cast of musicians, you can watch it on the Straits Times' Facebook and YouTube channel at 8.30pm later, so don't miss it. And those are our top stories for today. For more news and videos, visit straightstamps.com. And of course, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Harianto Diman. Join us tomorrow for more stories on A Big Story.